I just want to say this because I've been at many bedsides to pray for people to come back to life, and not all of them come back to life. And I, I just want to, for a moment, as, as Pastor Kevin was praying there, I was thinking about every nurse and health care provider in this room. And I just want to encourage you all for a moment, don't stop praying at the bedside. I know you may not be able to say it out loud, but your Lord and Savior hears you when you're praying in your spirit over those that you're praying at the bedside. And I know that there are just as many bad turnouts as there is good turnouts, but don't stop praying for those that are in beds to get out of them. Come on, I know some of you are low as nurses right now because it just seems like people keep dying. I'm telling you, God has not changed. He has always been the same. And His Spirit will work through you in those situations. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. If I've heard God speak, if you ask me abroad prophetically, if you ask me abroad what... What is God saying to you about where we're at as a nation, as a country, as a, as a, as a world? I, I, I would say that what I have heard most clearly is the statement has moved from get ready to be ready. And that's not to invoke fear. That's not because of the circumstantial things. That's because God is trying to refine the remnant. The Word of God says that a remnant will remain. He's trying to refine those that will remain. Meaning that when something happens in the middle of a service, what shows up? Panic and fear or the spirit of the living God? God is making His people ready. And praise the Lord that He has included this local assembly in that. That He has said, this is a place that I can work. This is a place that I can move. There are people there that are open to me using them. I mean, it's a pretty good scenario when you're laying there and every single person's hand that's on you is praying for you while they're working on you. But God is saying, be ready. Be ready. The, let the refiner work in you. Why? Because He desires to use you. Think about these words this morning. From Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 22. If you're ready for the word this morning, would you say amen? Amen. amen. All right, let's roll with it. Deuteronomy 7, verse 22. The Lord your God will drive out those nations ahead of you little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. In, in Deuteronomy 7, God is emphasizing that Israel is set apart as holy and that they are God's very special possession. As James was praying, we prayed for Jerusalem. He instructs the Israelites to eliminate the people of Canaan and as well as their corrupt culture. That's the context that we're getting here. Then they must occupy the promised land. But what stands out to me most out of all of this verse is what is said in the first sentence when it says, The Lord your God will drive out those nations ahead of you little by little. Not all at once, but little by little. If you know anything about the Israelites, you know that their journey, it was a journey and a process for them to enter in to the promised land. So my message this morning to you is this, God enjoys the journey and the process. God enjoys the journey and the process. For us, a lot of times the journey and the process sounds a lot like or looks a lot like a word called waiting. Yeah. If you look throughout history in the Bible, you see that Abraham waited 25 years after God promised him for Isaac to be born. Isaac then waited 20 years for his children. Joseph waited 13 years before he was set free and put on the throne. In some ways, Moses waited an entirety of 80 years. He, you know what's beautiful? is when you're going with God during the journey and the process, it's not about what you're 
waiting for, it's who you're waiting with. Amen? It's not about what you're waiting for, but who you're waiting with. I want to say this to you this morning. It's more than waiting. It's a journey and a process. And God works in both. In 2012, I, I don't share a ton about myself. I'm a fairly private person, but in 2012, I had surgery on my left knee. And at that point in time, I was going into my senior year uh, at Fairmont State, and my kneecap was in two pieces. And so they decided to do an experimental surgery in the hopes that it would make it better. They cut my quad away from my kneecap removed the smaller piece, and then screwed the quad back down to the kneecap that remained. And then there was a journey in a process. For months, the head trainer at Fairmont State would take my knee and he would put it in a machine. And he would decide how many degrees that day my knee would bend. It wasn't me bending it, it would be bent for me. It was a journey in a process. But here's the thing. If I wouldn't have went through the process, if I wouldn't have journeyed through it and, 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 and all that it entailed, I probably would have been re-injured or injured others in the process. How, how many of you, just, just by a show of hands, have, have you ever seen the end of something, but you knew it was going to take time to get there? Amen? Yeah, I see some hands. You knew that it was going to be a journey, and you knew that it was going to be a process. Like driving, yeah? <laughs> how, many in you, uh, how many of you in here have driven more than 10 hours? Raise your hands. 12 hours. Keep your hands up. 14. 16. 20, 25, 30, Timmy, how many? Days. days. Timmy didn't say hours. Timmy said days. Yeah, days that he drove. It was a journey and it was a process. And some of us, when we get in the car and go for a drive like that, we wish we could take a magic pill and just wake up there. And some have said, I've taken that pill. <laughs> and just woke up there. <laughs> but I'm guessing at some point when you turn into traveling from hours to days, you begin to enjoy the journey and the process in between the starting point and the destination, right? Maybe, maybe it's not traveling, maybe it's food. Like, I guess there's a, what is it, it's the term, hangry. You ever been hangry, right? And then you get to the point where, like, you had every intention of eating something good, but you're to the point where of no return, you're just hungry, so whatever you can get your hands on first is what you eat. Guys, a couple years ago, I'm going to show you a whole new side of one of your worship leaders here in a second. A couple years ago, we're driving around from church to church to hand out uh, some, some save the dates for a fire night that we were doing in Mannington. And it was me, Ashley, and her sister, Emily. And we're driving around, and, and I will never forget, Ashley was sitting in the back of the vehicle, and as we're driving, I said, man, we've been at this for a while, be nice to maybe get some lunch. And sweet little Ashley with her nice beautiful voice right out of nowhere says yeah I'm hungry and I to which I was like oh my gosh and she knew that I was surprised so she said I'm sorry no clearly we need to get something to eat right now yeah yeah Some of us are getting hungry right now because we should be leaving out this door. So here's the thing. If you're hungry right now, you want this. Show them. You definitely want that. You want that. 
You know what that is? That's Rev Kev's brisket. It's a journey and a process to get there. See, I, I love you. I've done some cooks with you. I just want to eat it now. Okay? Okay, so tell us. Start to finish when you begin to even think about starting the fire, prepping the meat. Start to finish without a crew. How long does that take? We cook 28 straight hours from Thursday to Friday. <laughs> it's a journey and a process. And if you're like me, I don't want, I don't want that. I want that. <laughs> yeah? You know That's what why else most you... people cheat and use propane. There. <laughs> You know what else you want with that? I'm, I'm just making it rough on y'all this morning. You want these with that. You know what those are? Those are Apple Annie's chocolate chip cookies. Fresh last night. But, but watch this. You know what these come with before you get this? This. A recipe. But see, I don't want this. I want this. I don't want to go through the journey and the process of what this, like, it's, there's words. Not, it's, I don't want words. I like the pictures, but I don't want words. I want this. Yeah? But it's a journey and a process. The same is this, see, see, life is a journey and a process, and it came with a recipe for everything that you would face. But I just, I don't, I want this, not this. I want Disney World Christianity, but not the struggle of Christianity. It's a journey in a process. Amen. Are you with me? But God enjoys the journey in the process. And since Timmy has been driving for days, we're going to give him some cookies for his trip. Amen. Yeah. God enjoys the journey in the process. It's, it's us that struggle with that waiting and those things that just seem they're just taking too long. See, there are other people in the Bible that know about things taking a long time. David was anointed as a king and, and, and then waited. I mean, what was that? What did that look like? I mean, I know we always look at Jesse's home and as Samuel's there and he anoints David, but then the journey and the process to become king is only in its beginning stages. And most scholars believe it was 15 years between him being anointed and actually being king until there was a crown, so to speak, put on his head. It was a journey and it was a process. And I think if you know anything about David's life, you could look. You, you can take that off there. I don't know. That's too, we're teasing him. Yep, we're teasing him. Some of us are thinking about eating. But I think if you would look, at, if we would look at David's life, before I get into this passage, I think we could look at David's life and say, man, I wish God talked to me like he did David. But here's the thing. God started with David where he was. And God can start with you where you are. Meaning that God can talk to you like he talked to David. But you've got to go with God. See, God spoke to Samuel before he spoke to David. It wasn't like David showed up and knew, hey, I'm about to get anointed as king. That's not what he said. He was out in the field, forgotten, not even included in that. What, what, kind, of, what kind of feelings did that bring as he steps into the room? But I love what David says after being anointed as king and going back into the shepherd's field. This is what he says Prior to slaying Goliath, I love these words from 1 Samuel 17, verses 40, 34 to 36. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, 
I catch it by its jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears. And I will do it to this pagan Philistine. Two, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. See, what David is saying in this moment to Saul is, is it started at a place. In a shepherd's field. It started as just a small journey that had a process in it. But what, what happens is, is that we see that David was honoring his earthly father by doing what his father had asked him to do. And while he was doing that, God's favor and grace and mercy showed up in David's life. Because, see, if you're about to kill a lion or a bear, I don't care who you are, you are talking to God before you kill that lion and that bear. And you are most definitely talking to God after you kill that lion and that bear. But we don't get that included and in, in really get to see that the fact that David started somewhere in his, li- in his life and in his relationship with God. And in that place, we don't see that God was talking to him, but rather that he was just being faithful and obedient. And as he was faithful and obedient, God began to show up and move in his life. It's a journey. It's a process. And God enjoys the journey in the process. Now, I had about a page of what I could tell you about David's life, and most of you would know these things. But I think you could look at David's life, and we can say this about David's life. David had years of stability, but David also had years of sorrow and instability. He, he had times where, he, there were times where he would run and hide, Then there were times where he would conquer giants. Then other times where it seemed like the giants were going to conquer him. Times where he was with and for God's people, and other times it seemed like he was against God's people. David gets to the point in his life where he actually spits and drools on himself to act like a madman in order to spare his own life. He then commits adultery and murder and then watches his own child die. This is the life of David. David had years of stability, but also years of sorrow. And throughout all of that, God built a legacy because God enjoys the journey and the process. But see, God also enjoys when we let him lead the journey. And when we talk to him during the process. It's one thing to know that God enjoys journeying and processing with you, but it's another thing to let him lead the journey and another thing to talk to him during the process. David was doing his best to let God lead. David is spoken of as a man after God's own heart. And it's, it seems to be pretty consistent that as he was talking to God during the process, we get glimpses all throughout Scripture of where he was going to God during the journey and during the process. David is responsible for writing at least 75 of the Psalms. I love what he says in Psalm 39, verses 1 to 4. This is what he says. I said to myself, I will watch what I do and not sin in what I say. I will hold my tongue when the ungodly are around me. This kind of sounds like something Pastor James just prayed a few minutes ago. But as I stood there in silence, not even speaking good things, the turmoil within me grew worse. The more I thought about it, the hotter I got. Igniting a flame of words. Lord, remind me, let me remember, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered. How fleeting my life really is. What I believe David is saying in this moment moment is, is God, I've only been given so much time on earth here. I understand that it is a journey and a process, but I want you to be at the center of my life so that what I say will exalt you instead of exalt man. I want you to shine through because I've made you the center of my life. I've made you the one who is leading the journey and writing the instructions during the process. Throughout latter parts of 
1 Samuel and into the first parts of 2 Samuel, David inquires of the Lord, meaning that he asks of God nine different times. But in those nine times, there's one that stands out to me as greater than all of the rest. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 to 8. I encourage you to spend some time with this this week. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at their town of Ziglag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and, and Ziglag. They had crushed Ziglag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and the children and everyone else but, everyone else but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives and the widows of Nain of, Car of Carmel were among those captured. David was, not, was, now, was now in great danger. Okay, so get this picture. David is there with his men that he's been in battle with, and all of a sudden they come back and there's nothing there. And you, you think about what happens when leaders are followed and something goes wrong. Who's to blame? The leader. And so the, the people or the soldiers are going to begin to turn on David in this moment. That David was now in great danger because all of his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they begin to talk about stoning him. And in this moment where David has experienced years of stability, instability, and sorrow, David is, 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 this is probably one of the most profound verses in all of the Old Testament. It says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. In other translations, it says David strengthened himself in the Lord. Powerful imagery of what's happening here. Then he said to the priest, bring the ephod. And so he brought it. And then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So here's what I want to say to you this morning. I have five things and we're done. Five things that I think we can pull from this that are to be applied in our life as we're on the journey and in the process. Number one is this. Go to God. Go to God. God. Listen, these five things that I'm about to tell you are not profound things. You know what kingdom has been telling I me mean, for the least for the 10 years that I've been here? Fast, pray, worship, scripture study. Fast, pray, worship, scripture study. It's not glamorous, but, it, but when you set up these foundations as you are journeying in life and in the process, you'll know exactly what to do when a man goes down in your service. Are you with me? That means I go to God when it isn't good. And I go to God when it is good. And I go to God when I'm indifferent. Well, no matter how I'm feeling, I go to God. David, time after time, went to God. You get into this place where he could have been fearful and just let them kill him. But he turns and goes with God. He strengthens himself with God. I mean, you think about that. This church has taught so many times that, and this is just another beautiful imagery of not really repentance in this moment, but him choosing to display that I'm living a life of repentance, and so I'm going to go with God. He's turning from what the circumstances and the situation is. He doesn't, he's not ignoring that, but he's seeking God in that by turning to him. Let me ask you this. Is God your default setting? When something happens, who is it that you call? Who is it that you talk to? What is it that you do? When something happens in your service, where do you go first? Go to God. Number two is this. Worship God. The Bible says for the spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise. Did you know it is a neurological fact here? It is impossible to be in the state of appreciation and the state of fear at the same time. 
It is impossible for you to be grateful and thanking God and afraid at the same time. You can't do it. Your mind can't do it. It has to choose. The Bible says, for the spirit of heaviness put on the garment of praise. This is quite literally what David is doing. He's taking the ephod, which is the garment of praise, placing it on himself and saying, I'm not running from fear, I'm going to God. That's important. Because David is, if he's a man that really is after the heart of God, yes, there were times where he was running from things, but this is not a time where you see him running. This is a time where you see him turning. And as he's turning, he's put on the presence of God to say, I want to I worship you right now. I've tried to run before and it got, hasn't gotten me in good places. So in this moment, I'm going to do nothing but seek you. I'm not running from fear, and I'm not ignoring the situation, but God, I need you. And the greatest place for me to start is in worship, because I am heavy, and I want it to go. So I'm going to go ahead and begin to thank you. Go to God. Worship God. The third thing is to talk to God. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. The high priest, who is Jesus Christ, He's ours. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You, you can talk to God. You have freedom and access to Christ because of his own sacrifice for you. I mean, yes, am I a sinner saved by grace? My goodness, yes. But I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I was taught that at 15 years old in your living room. And that's what I live by. That's not arrogance. That's the reality that I have taken hold of Christ, and he lives in me. And because he lives in me, I'm not living chained to this world and saying, well, there's only certain people that have access to Jesus. No, I just read to you that by his sacrifice, it's given me access to him, and so I can come to him boldly and receive his mercy and grace and say, God, I need an answer here. I'm not demanding God, but man, you can get in the heart where you usher God. He knows the heart to talk to God. Go to God. Worship God. Talk to God. Fourth thing, listen to God. Get, watch this, get to where He can hear you, but more importantly, get to where you can hear him you got to get to where you can hear him it won't be in the noise i promise you it won't be in, in all the distractions and all the other things that are going on jesus himself said when you pray go into your room close the door behind you and seek your father who already knows what you're going to say so but okay so pray, yes pray why because it's about the relationship and the communion with him he wants to hear from you Sometimes you can't go and close your door. It says that Jesus, I shared it with you last week, Jesus walked a stone's throw away in the Garden of Gethsemane. It means that he shut the door and sought his Father just like he always did because the Scriptures teach that Jesus often withdrew. It was King Hezekiah that turned his face to the wall. Standing, I mean, you, you th today was a perfect example of what's happening there. A man is on his deathbed, and, and Isaiah has come to tell him, hey, you're not going to recover from this. The Lord says you're going to die. A chapter before that, he had just received word from the Lord that they were going to be fine, that they were going to be saved, and they were triumphing in God. A chapter later, he's going to die. And God hears the cry of his heart because he says, you know what? We're not in the New Testament yet, but I'm going to go ahead and exemplify that Christ that can be seen in all of Scripture. 
and model something that he's going to teach later on by turning my face to this wall and seeking God, not the people that are around me. And God says, I'll give you 15 more years. You got to get to where you can listen to him. Number five is obey God. The scriptures teach that God delights in obedience over sacrifice. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. He enjoys the journey and the process because it provides, I hope you hear this, it provides opportunities to commit to a relationship with him. The journey and the process, God is, see, God is always opening doors along the journey and the process. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't know you. All along the way, he's opening doors for himself to be revealed. He's in the journey and in the process. But in that, it does provide opportunities for the believer to, to commit to a, 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 an eternal relationship. Not a relationship that's chained to this world, but a relationship that will last forever. And then the process invites the opportunity for that relationship to be built. I'm deciding in the journey to what? Journey with him. And when I come to a process, I'm talking to him. Why? So it can refine me and build into, him, into me what James just prayed a few minutes ago, the hope of glory to be revealed. Spirit of God, tell me, show me, lead me. I, 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 my brother-in-law sent me a, a sermon illustration this week, and I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It, it, was a, it was a pastor, and he had this big buff guy standing up beside of him. And he said, see, some people go to the gym, but the gym never goes with them. And some people go to the gym, and the gym goes with them. Meaning this, there are some people that come to church, and they'll say, well, because I went to church, I can live how I want to live. I can eat what I want to eat. I can drink what I want to drink. I can do what I want to do. The person that goes to the gym but the gym doesn't go with them says, I can have that extra beer, I can eat that cake because I went to the gym. So going to the gym is just an excuse to live how I want to live. So I don't actually have a relationship. But the person that goes to the gym and the gym comes with them says, I can't eat that, I can't go there, I can't do those things. See, there are some people in the church that will say, I went to church but the church hasn't went with me. That I checked it off so I can say those words, talk to those people how I want, and do the things I want to do. See, no, that's not a relationship. It's on the priority list, but it's not a relationship. And there are some that say, and I hope there are some people in here this morning that will say amen to this and give some shouts and praise to God. That you have decided that the Sunday morning you is the same you every single day of the week. And I've been with God. I invited him into the journey. He's leading the way and I'm in process. But the same person you got this morning is the same person you're going to get on Friday night. I've been with Jesus and Jesus has been with me. He lives in me. That's closer than any earthly relationship I have. And if he's really in there, then he's got to come out. It's fire shut up in your bones. And if it's not, then I need to say, Lord, pour your spirit into me. I'm not saying you have to be as passionate or animated as I am, but I'm just telling you. If you've been with Jesus, your life has changed. If it hasn't, then I wonder if you've been with Jesus. It's not time to get ready. It's time to be ready. And he is with you in and through the journey and the process. See, what's really amazing about all this is as we look at David's life, we can say, man, David really went after God. But you know what else is really cool? God went after Peter like nobody else's business. 
Yes, David went after God and you should go after him. But let me tell you, whether you pursue God or not, he's coming after you. He's coming. That's who he is. He's the relentless hound of heaven and he never stops barking. He's the dog that won't be quiet in the middle of the night. He's there. He enjoys, go ahead, he enjoys the journey and the process. Listen, you can too. You want to know why? Because Jesus said in John 16, you will have many troubles in this world, but take heart because I've overcome it. If he enjoys it, you can enjoy it too. Take heart, for I've overcome the world. Think about what the writer of Hebrews says. The writer of Hebrews says this, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let the gym go with you and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to be on a journey so Jesus may as well be in it. I'm going to have a time where I'm going to be in process so Jesus may as well be in it. If I'm going to wait, he's going to be working in it. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus, who is the champion, who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy that awaited him. This, this, is, this, this should screw up our minds because it says there was a joy awaiting him. What joy? The cross. Who clings to a cross? Who embraces it with joy? Your king. Your Savior. Why? Because he's saying, you're worth it. You're worth it. He endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and now is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. And as James said, he's literally on his knees interceding for you and I now. Jesus himself said it like this when he walked the earth. So you don't have to worry about these things saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? Or what will I wear? These things dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and all and his righteousness and all these other things. Everything else will be added unto you. He knows what you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. Why? For tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Today's troubles are enough today. Jesus is saying it isn't about the destination. If you study and look at Jesus' words, you're not going to find a ton of places where Jesus was saying, oh, you're going to come to heaven with me. You're going to come to heaven. No, the kingdom of God is where? At hand. He was saying, as you invite me into the journey and you take me in during the process, then the destination will take care of itself. The destination will take care of itself. We are his representatives. And one of the things that happens when you journey and process with God is that in the journey, it begins to increase our trust in him. In the process, the process begins to crucify our idols. God begins to rid our lives of all the things that aren't him so that we can become more like him. Praise team, would you come? I want to challenge you this morning. Would you do this? Would you ask God to lead the journey? Would you talk to him during the process? I want you to know this. Know that out of those two things, the journey and the process, the most important thing to God is you. 
in the journey and in the process, the most important thing to God is you. Why? Because He loves you. He loves you. And if I could ask you to do one thing in your life today, is to say whether there's ups, whether there's downs, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose those five things. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to listen to God, and I'm going to obey Him. And I'm going to live that out day in and day out. See, this isn't a glamorous moment where it sets up this amazing opportunity for you to solely respond in this moment. See, this is an amazing opportunity because it sets up a lifetime for you to be transformed and changed in the likeness of Christ. Because some people can sit where they are today and say, you know what, I hear that message and I'm not going forward, but I'm deciding today to do those things. To simply decide to say, you know what, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to worship Him. I'm going to talk to Him. I'm going to listen and I'm going to obey. I'm going to do that every single day of my life. Every pastor in this church has stood up here and said, if you give us a year, your life will be different. I'm telling you the same thing. If you'll do those five things for a year, your life will be different. Your life will change. Don't you feel the fatigue in the room? People are tired. And things like thing, things like what happened yesterday happened, and, and we can't even get emotional about it. We're just tired. I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm not turning back. That's who my hope's in. He's the only one that's going to save us. Would you pray with me? Father, right now, in this place, would be, we be those that are committing to daily, surrendering to you, to come to you, to worship you, to talk to you, to listen to you, and to obey you. May our lives be the evidence of who you are in everything that we think, say, and do. Father, we thank you for your grace during the journey and in the process. Use everyone in this room, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Lord, the three words that I'm hearing as Daniel finishes up the word that you've given him is at my post. Ashley's dad and I were talking early Friday morning about gospel rhythm. It's the rhythm of your life. Daniel speaks the word that he speaks here this morning, and I hear at my post. Jesus, I love that passage where you just say, look, when people say I'm here or people say I'm there, just stay where you are. Just like lightning flashes in the sky, you'll know when it's me. And so at my post. It's what happened today, Lord God service begins, we see what's going on in the world, and we stay at our post. In the middle of a prayer, something rises up at our post. What do you want to do, Daniel? Let's keep going, Kev. Amen. At our post. And here we are now with this blessed sacrament in front of us. I wonder, Lord God, <laughs> is this the post 
of the people in this room. I know it is of some, but it's the point that Daniel just made. How are we going to leave here? If we're not going to leave here with you, then there's no sense of coming forward and receiving this sacrament. But if we will be at our post in this room the same way that we're at our post out there, declaring that Jesus is Lord, then Lord, you're telling us, come on. You come on. You receive that sacrament. You declare to the world, Jesus is Lord. You declare to the world that my death, my burial, my resurrection defeated sin and death forever. And I don't care what comes up. I'm still on the throne, and I'm still the King of kings, and I'm still the Lord of lords, and nothing changes. Is that your post today? If that's your post, then acknowledge the fact that this bread is the representation of your body, Lord Jesus Christ, which you've given for us. And we will take it, and we will eat it, in remembrance of you. And likewise, Lord Jesus Christ, if this is our post, then we will acknowledge right here and right now by giving our lives to it that this juice is the representation of your blood, blood of the new covenant, poured out for the remission of our sins. And we will take it and we will drink it in remembrance of you. You gave yourself for us, Lord God, and you rose from us the dead. Will we give ourselves to you resurrection and life and never leave our post? Praise be to your name, Lord God. As I receive, I pray that people make that decision for the first time or declare it again. Hmm. Thank you, God. With these elements of Holy Communion sanctified, with the table set and the invitation offered, I pray with confession from the abundance of their hearts that you, Lord Jesus Christ, are Lord. I pray that everyone in this room would come. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. If the Lord has called you and you have responded to him through submission to him, then please come receive this blessed sacrament.